welcome back to the Amateur Radio FCC General License Course. It's a wonderful day in the Amateur Radio neighborhood, and I hope you're ready to get started. Um, once you uh, earn your general license, you'll be able to experiment with digital modes uh, as they were invented, um, and perhaps even you might even invent something yourself, who knows. Um, you'll also be able to participate in contests and even earn awards uh, for operating on the HF bands. You'll get to be an ambassador for the United States and uh, promote goodwill um, for America and other, case, uh, other nations or other countries. Uh, but it also allows you to fulfill an important role in the amateur radio community. The knowledge uh, that you will gain... Uh, allows you to become somebody's mentor, or Elmer as it's known historically. And I believe that by teaching others is the best way to really learn something in depth. Um, so I invite you as you learn to help others learn and grow as well. So are you ready to learn? Well, let's get started. This is lesson two, part one of the amateur Radio General Class License Course. I'm your instructor, uh, Gary Stevens, Kilo Echo 2 Golf Sierra. That's KE2GS. Today we're going to be talking about sub element uh, G2, which is uh, operating procedures. Uh, there are five exam questions out of the five groups. And in operating procedures, we're basically uh, talking about phone operations, operating currency, uh, CW operations, digital modes, of uh, the volunteer monitoring program, and uh, digital operating procedures. So let's uh, take a deeper dive into phone operating uh, procedures, uh, upper side band, lower side band conventions, and breaking into a contact and voice operated relay operations or vox so as you recall um, upper sideband is where uh, only part of the, the the bandwidth is used for transmission it's uh, uh, when you receive it it's it's kind of mirrored and it uh, you know, the whole uh, bandwidth is, is uh, reported. Uh, but for the exam, you need to know that the upper side band is the most common one that's used for voice communications on frequencies of 14 megahertz or higher. Likewise, we need to know for the exam that the lower side band is the most commonly used uh, portion for voice communications on the 160 meter, 75 meter, and 40 meter bands. Um, as a technician, you may or may not have uh, realized that the upper sideband is uh, most commonly used uh, for uh, single sideband communications on VHF and UHF. Um, most radios in those bands uh, do not support uh, single sideband. Uh, you have to have an all-mode uh, transceiver in order to do so. Continuing with uh, the theme, um, you need to know for the exam that the upper side band is what's uh, used on the 17 meter and 12 meter bands for voice communications. Yeah, I promise there's going to be an end to this soon, uh, the, the, the single side band questions. Um, but you need to know for the exam that single side band is the mode of voice communications that is most commonly used on HF amateur bands. Um, and also you need to know for the exam that uh, the advantage of using single uh, side band compared to other uh, voice uh, modes uh, such as FM or the analog modes um, is it uses less bandwidth and you have greater power efficiency because you're only transmitting on one portion of the band. You can focus all the energy on that portion. And only the side band is transmitted. Uh, the other side band uh, and the carrier is suppressed. Uh, and that's what's true of a single side band voice mode. I mean, if it wasn't suppressed, it would not be 
uh, a sideband, it would be a full band. So hopefully as a technician you're accustomed to this, um, but a common way to break into the uh, phone contact is just saying your call sign once. So imagine a conversation, you know, 40 meters was hopping today, you know, I was making uh, 30 contacts barefoot with my FT897 and you want to break in, you just simply say something like KE2GS. And we always want to make a habit of doing the right thing and uh, do, operate in the right mode. So um, it's a good practice, or no for the exam, it's a good practice uh, uh, to use the lower side band on 160, 75 meters, and 40 meter bands. So one of the advantages of uh, setting your uh, uh, rig to the Vox mode uh, is that you can do it hands-free. So voice operated, you know, hands-free, it makes it uh, work sort of like a, a cell phone. Uh, you don't have to do use the push to talk. So for the exam, know that the advantage is uh, of Vox is uh, that it's hands-free. So DX is uh, generally referred to as contact. DX is long distance communications. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, or know for the exam that generally any station outside the lower 48 uh, should respond to the station in the continuous 48 states who call CQDX. So if you hear CQDX uh, and it's a local station, you're, they're trying to contact uh, Europe or uh, Asia. When we speak of ALC, we're generally talking about uh, automatic level control. Uh, so you need to know for the exam uh, that uh, transmit audio and microphone gain is typically adjusted by uh, proper ALC settings in an amateur radio single sideband, uh, such as, uh, I don't know if you could see it or not, but on this particular radio. And we're sailing through this, so in this next session uh, we're going to talk about um, operating courtesy, uh, band plans, emergencies, and crew leading drills, and emergency communications. So I remember one year uh, at field day, uh, an operator became kind of aggravated because uh, there was just some people rag chewing on uh, one of the frequencies and they wanted to use it for contesting or for the field day operations. Um, but except during emergencies, no amateur station has priority or access uh, to any frequency. And they expect you to know that for the exam. I think that uh, you would never hear any distress calls on amateur radio, but it happens. A classic case was uh, back during the 30s uh, when Amelia Earhart was trying to circumnavigate the world uh, her plane went down somewhere over the Pacific and some amateur radio operators heard her distress calls. It was quickly dismissed, but they heard it and they reported it. Um, today, I think they take things more seriously. But for the exam, you need to know that the first thing you should do if you're communicating with another amateur station and a distress break-in is uh, you hear somebody is in distress, acknowledge a station in distress and to determine what assistance may be needed. Um, you might want to ask also their location and uh, uh, you know, reassure them that you're going to do whatever you can to help them. You know, one thing about amateur radio is that propagations can change at the drop of a hat. Uh, but a good amateur practice, uh, propagation does change and uh, you notice some interference from other stations uh, on the frequencies. Um, you know, for the exam, you need to know that uh, attempt to resolve the interference problem with the other station in a mutually acceptable manner. You know, don't get into any arguments or anything. Because uh, CW has such a narrow bandwidth, uh, you only need 150 to 500 hertz of uh, separation. Uh, so know that for the exam, uh, that, you know, 150 to 500 is the minimum separation used uh, to minimize interference. In contrast, uh, for our voices, we use, only use about 3 kilohertz of uh, 
you know, for the voice range, you know, which is from very low to very high, very high. Um, so for the exam, you need to know that approximately three kilohertz is the minimum separation that should be used uh, to minimize interference to stations on adjacent frequencies. It's a good way to uh, prevent uh, harmful interference is uh, always ask if somebody's using frequency. You know, if, uh, you know, they're Maybe a lull in a conversation or something. Um, but, you know, just go on the air and ask, uh, is anybody uh, using this frequency? This is KE2GS. Um, it's easy to do, and it's also a question on the exam. Notice this chart just keeps reappearing. And it's a good reason because a lot of questions come from this chart. Uh, for the exam, you need to know that it's a good amateur practice when choosing a frequency on which to initiate a call. It's you're following the voluntary uh, band, band plan uh, for the operation mode that you intend to use. And where do you get this information? This handy little chart. And this is still a band plan, but it's on the band plan web page uh, in a different format. Uh, for the exam, you need to know that uh, the band plan restriction for U.S. stations transmitting within the four, 48 contiguous uh, states on uh, 50.1 and 50.125 megahertz uh, applies only to stations that are not within the 48 contiguous states. So during an emergency, uh, emergency management personnel be, be tempted to grab your radio mic from you and, and talk, but you can't let them do that because only FCC licensed amateurs are allowed. And this is a test question. So for the exam, just know that the only person holding, only a person that's holding the FCC issued amateur license may operate uh, an, a RACI's uh, transmitter during uh, relief efforts. When it comes to an emergency that involves life, limb, or property, uh, you may use any means at your disposal to uh, contact uh, help. Uh, and this is a test question. Uh, just know for the exam that any time during an actual emergency, an amateur station allowed, is allowed to use any means at their disposal to assist another station in distress. It would be silly uh, if you were by chance uh, in a crash plane and you're needing to contact uh, uh, someone for help, uh, you, you would not call on a frequency that uh, does not guarantee you help. So for the exam, just know that uh, the frequency that you should use to send a, a distress call is whatever frequency that has the best chance of reaching uh, someone. And this concludes uh, Lesson 2, Part 1. I really hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. Be sure to take uh, practice exams on your favorite website and, or your favorite app on your uh, smart devices. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, it'll help you to uh, find out when new videos are posted. And if you have any questions or comments, please post them below and I'll get to them as soon as I can. Until next time, never stop learning. Uh -huh.